see you. Good to see you. It is a gorgeous day here in Boston. Gorgeous. Finally, we it was like we had two marches. We'd never had April. So. <laughs> wow. Well, it's beautiful here too. It's about 78 degrees, but it's cooler than that may suggest, and it just feels great. I've been so ready for spring. Yeah. Thank God for spring. Awesome. Well, today we are going to be talking about two-way communication and what to do when someone dominates the conversation, even if that person is you. Deacon Michael, tell us a little bit more about why this is important. Well, conversation is meant to be like a ping pong match, right? It's a dialogue. It's a two-way conversation. And somebody gave me that metaphor back when I was a young executive and I'll never forget it. It's like, you know, you hit the, the ball over the net to the other person, and then they return it to you. The problem is sometimes you get some people who think they can play ping pong as a solo sport, and they want to dominate the conversation. And sometimes as leaders, because we've been put into that position as a leader, you know, maybe we're, you know, a, a lay leader, maybe we're a deacon, priest, a bishop. We think because we have that position, it gives us the right or there's the expectation that we should do all the talking. And that's not good because the truth is everybody made in the image of God has something important and a perspective to communicate. It's awesome. Okay, so as we begin, let, we wanna encourage you to post your questions in the comment section of YouTube or wherever you happen to be watching. Deacon Michael will be answering those questions live in the second half of our show. If you want to ask your question anonymously, you can text us at 615-721-2303. All okay. right. I'll get us going here. Okay. So we're going to start by assuming that you're the one talking too much. And I don't mean by you, Anne, but uh, that we all, as leaders, are the ones who are talking too much. This is just a aspect of self-leadership. It's always good to look in the mirror first and ask ourselves if we're guilty of the very thing that sometimes we don't like in other people. And I found that in my own leadership that that's often the case, that sometimes when I judge somebody else, it's because I have fundamentally got a problem with that issue myself. So we're going to start with that assumption. And if you don't think you talk too much, you know, perhaps you're at the exception, but in my experience, talking too much is kind of the default for leaders, particularly the younger you are. Now, over time, hopefully, you know, you, you learn to listen and you see the value of listening, particularly if, if you're committed to personal growth, but it's not that easy. Often it's just a lack of self-awareness. But stay with us because we can fix that. But before we get into it, we need to understand a few reasons why we talk too much. And Anne, you may have some things to throw into this mix as well. But let me just start with a couple of reasons. I've got three reasons and you can pile on if you've got more. But I think reason number one is we just don't realize what we're doing. It's really hard to be self-aware. And it's really hard to be self-aware in real time, like when we're managing a meeting or we're having a conversation with somebody. And usually when somebody is talking too much, they're not being malicious. You know, they, they don't obviously have the self-perception that they're talking too much. They're usually just trying to be helpful. But that's reason number one. We're just, we're just not aware of what we're doing. Reason number two, and this is kind of a funny one, but we're not prepared to communicate. You know, it's kind of like that, that old thing. I think it was a Mark Twain quote where he said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that my letter wasn't shorter, but I just didn't have time, you know, to, to really think it through. And I think, and he, he said it more eloquently than that, but you get the idea. And I think sometimes there's, there's some of us as leaders, and this would be true of me, we think with our mouth open. So I'm kind of processing out loud and can inadvertently dominate the conversation because I don't have clear talking points. I've not really thought through in a structured way what it is I want to say. I'm just, just yapping, you know, hoping that some clarity comes out of the mix. And then reason number three is that I think that some leaders use it as a way of exerting control. You know, they kind of have a command and control view of leadership that they're the leader. They need to be barking out orders. They need to do all the talking, all the thinking for everybody else. And everybody else is there just to to kind of do their bidding, and they may ask for a clarification about their role, but it's pretty much up to us to talk. And I, I don't think any of those are healthy. Do you have anything yeah. you want to add? I would just say I really resonate 
for with ministry, especially for number two, and that being unprepared to communicate. I don't mm -hmm. think um, I don't think there's any expectation really in the church worlds that I know that to come in really prepared for meetings. There, there isn't the expectation. So it's hard to not just roll in and try to figure out what you're saying as you say it, <laughs> you know, which it is isn't amazing, helpful. isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, yeah. I often find this the case too. And it often happens when somebody calls a leading, we talked about this ad nauseum on the show, but a leader comes in to a meeting without an agenda. And so just starts talking and, you know, without an agenda, you don't know if the conversation is off course. You don't know right. if somebody's chasing a rabbit because there are no boundaries, right? You haven't right. established those with an agenda. So nobody knows when they're off track. So yeah, that's, that's at least the very bare bone minimum for not talking too much is have an agenda. And I, and I actually think the other thing is there are some often super legit reasons for not being prepared. You know, you just had a funeral and three confessions and you are just reeling from those potentially, you know? Yep. Um, there are a lot of, you know, and, and I, I've said this before, but I do think a lot of people who go into ministry have a different skill set that often isn't doing all the strategic work to be super prepared to communicate. Yeah, that's fair. You know, um, certainly taking a homiletics class, it'll help you with your preaching, but it's not going to help you in the run of the mill meetings that, that typically you're going to have. By the way, one hack for that, and I do this mm -hmm. with our executive committee at St. Vlad Seminary, is we put together an agenda in Google Docs, or I should say we use a, an agenda template. And then we ask people, you know, usually the week before, hey, here's the link. And if there's something you want to talk about, go ahead and put it in the agenda. And, you know, we'll kind of organize it right before we meet. But it kind of helps you to uh, brainstorm storm or crowdsource the agenda. And sometimes there'll be things that are you really don't want to talk about or you want to save for another time. But that's to kind of, you know, at least gives it some structure so that the full burden is not on you as the leader. Yeah, that's great. All awesome. Right. So should we talk about how to fix this problem? Let's do it. How do we <laughs> fix it? How do we, how do we, how do we get ourselves out of this challenge? Okay. So I've got basically six steps because I like to break things down and steps and principles and all the rest, but I've got six steps here to try to help all of us make sure that we're not dominating the conversation, that we're engaging in a two-way conversation, but also want to talk about what do you do with that, that person that's on your parish council, you know, or that's on the um, metropolis council or whatever other organizational body who just wants to be the one that they've got an answer for everything. They always are the first person to raise their hand. They talk, 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 talk. And after a while, people kind of get frustrated or whatever. So we'll talk about that. Two. Okay, so step number one, get clarity before you communicate. So I want to share this thing that we talked about all the way back in episode number seven, which is the clarity grid. And so it looks like this. And it basically one axis is whether or not the thought is expressed or unexpressed. And then whether we're specific or we're vague. And so a lot of the communication that happens that we're considering tonight, the reason we talk too much is because we haven't thought it through, particularly on this one point. You know, we, we haven't thought it through, we haven't gotten clarity before we communicate, so it comes out in zone two as garbled communication. You say what you were thinking, but it's imprecise, so people don't know what it means. And the result? Ignorance. People walk away not really knowing what it was that you intended to communicate. So step number one, again, is get the clarity before you communicate. Um, to fix that, think before you speak. Now, that seems obvious, right? But again, for those of us like me who are external processors, sometimes I don't know what I think till I say it. And so sometimes you just have to give a little bit of thought before you say it. And when in doubt, write it out. 
And this is particularly important when there's a lot at stake. So for example, if you're having to deliver bad news or hard news, like maybe it's a layoff or something, or a termination, or you know, uh, it, it could be any number of things, but whenever the stakes are high, it's really important to write it out because thoughts disentangle themselves passing over the lips and through pencil tips. I don't know who first said that, but I'll never forget it because it's true. And so I always try to come up with a good set of talking points before I go into those high stakes situations because you, it, it's easy to get emotional. You know, it's easy to get derailed in those kinds of situations. But if I have a set of talking points that I can stay on track, and I can keep from getting swept up in the emotion, or if I do get swept up in the emotion, at least I can get back on track if I have a track to run on. And that's the, the value of talking points. Plus, it gives you a chance to make sure that uh, you've got just the right amount of truth and love. And I, I, I love St. Paul's admonition to speak the truth in love. And I think that takes thinking, sometimes writing it out, but to make sure that you communicate it in a way that's candid but at the same time is kind. Does that make sense? That's awesome. Oh, it makes a ton of sense. Yeah, and without that, I think I've said this before, but the, the writ, written form is, uh, you know, I don't know what I think until I see what I say. And it just, you get to do it. Instead of doing it in front of people, you get to do it um, so you do have clarity ahead of time. I think, I think that it's just the challenge of time probably. Yeah. At that point. You know, making sure you have the time, um, especially when things are moving fast. It is, and uh, but I think, I think if we would think of it more as an investment, that will save us time in the end. Maybe you've heard that old adage. I I heard this from a boss years ago. He said, "Why is it that we never have time to do it right the first time, but we always find time to do it over?" And that's great. And there's a lot of times when because we haven't taken a little bit of time to think it through we create more confusion and ultimately create more work for ourselves because we didn't clearly communicate. I just did this within the last couple of weeks. And, and part of it was that, and I did take some time ahead of time to write down, you know, notes, but then I actually wasn't thinking about the receiver. I was thinking about what I needed to get out in my head yeah, and not about what they needed to hear. That's, and it was a big, yeah. That's easy to do. And I, th I think that one of the things that's enormously helpful under this first step is to kind of put yourself in the shoes of the other person and think through how are they going to respond? You know, like one of the things I've learned in the corporate world, and I think this is true in church world too, is that everybody's tuned into the most popular radio station in the world, which is WIIFM, what's in it for me. So they want to know, you know, how is this going to impact me? And I yeah. think sometimes when we're communicating high stake things, it's, it's worth kind of reminding them about what's not going to change so they can kind of settle down and yeah. listen because yeah. people tend to catastrophize, to make it more dramatic than it is. And obviously to think, you know, what does this mean for me? You know, yeah. so. That's great. Okay. So step one is get clarity before you communicate. Tell us about step two. Step two, engage your audience. So when you send a text or an email, and it depends if the other person has this turned on, but you often get a red receipt. And that's pretty cool because it lets you know that the other person has read the message. You still don't know if they understood it, but at least you know they got it, and that's half the battle. But whenever you communicate, especially in person, you kind of got to ask for a red receipt. You know, did they get it? And so I want to just share a couple of techniques, three techniques for verifying that your message was received and hopefully understood. So number one, make eye contact, make eye contact. Uh, there's a reason why parents, and it's fun to watch my grown daughters with their kids, will say to them, you know, look at my eyes because the kid's distracted. Look at my eyes. They're telling them something important that they want to pay attention to. But uh, that tells them that the child is listening. And I think that that's one of the ways that we communicate to other people that we're listening is give them eye contact 
And it's also one of the things where we know that other people are tuned into our frequency when they're making eye contact with us. Now, I, I get that sometimes people look away just like I just did when they're thinking, but I'm talking about are they are they present or are they do they seem to be some somewhere else? And particularly if their heads in a device, oh, that's like the worst of all. When they've got their head in a device, that's usually a bad sign. So that's number one, make eye contact. Number two, pay attention to body language. Now, I'm not saying you've got to become a you know FBI certified body language specialist. And yes, there are actually people that do that. I've got a client that's one. But um, but just simple things. You know, is their posture open? Do they seem to be nodding? Do they seem to be engaged? Or are they falling asleep? Are they getting distracted? Are they paying attention to something else? And oftentimes when that happens in a meeting, and I could tell you so many meetings from the boardroom, but uh, I'll just stop. Wait for them to look up. You know, because I, I feel like I'm wasting my breath. And I, I back in the, the Great Recession, when I was running a big public company, uh, I would often have our board members totally lost in their devices while we were trying to make a presentation. And it was enormously disrespectful and frustrating to those of us who were trying to make a presentation, particularly uh, when they would ask a question immediately after we finished about something that we'd already clarified and presented, but they were asking it like they'd never heard it before. So that's frustrating. Number three is request informal feedback. And I often do this with you. I'll make a point that I'll say, does this make sense? You know, because sometimes it doesn't, or sometimes there needs to be further clarification. So to just ask a question like that, you know, are you, are you guys still with me? You know, does this make sense? Or do you have any questions? Just anything where you come up for air and give other people a chance, again, to return the ball back over the net. Here's a question for you. Okay. If, if you were coaching somebody who struggled to pay attention to body language and, you know, was, got caught up in their own description of a point, um, and this was in a con conversation versus maybe a presentation or a sermon or something, is there even a, a sort of a time limit that you'd say, okay, talk for this amount of time and then make sure you're asking, does that make sense? Then make sure you're, you stop to make sure the other person's engaged. Yeah, you know, I think the answer today, Anne, is a lot different than it would have been 20 years ago. Yeah. Because I think in, in my experience, people have much shorter attention spans. Yeah. And even when I'm presenting in, 20 years ago, what I could have done in a keynote, well, first of all, keynotes are shorter in my experience. And sometimes I get asked, you know, I had somebody the other day that wanted me to do a 90 minute keynote. I said, no, nah, you don't want that. You don't want a 90 minute keynote. Maybe a 30 minute with a 30 minute Q&A or my, my ideal, ideal thing. And in my business coaching, group coaching um, sessions where we'll have 50 people in the room, you know, I literally go for like two or three minutes and then ask a question. And in a conversation, it's probably more like 60 seconds or so. Yeah. 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 The problem is our perception of time is very relative. Right. Like, like you were saying, when you're like totally swept up in the moment and the point you're trying to make, you may think, well, I'm only talking for 20 seconds. And then you go, uh, you look at your watch and you go, I think I just talked nonstop for five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I watch this in conversation and I work with, you know, just end up working with a lot of bright people and I watch a long point getting made and I watch the fidgets around the table. And I think, man, if they, it's, they, how do they not know to stop right now? You know, yeah. that they keep going on and you've lost everybody at this point. And so I, you know, what's, the, what's the, uh, if you're the one who's get so into your point, you don't notice what's going on. Um, with people, you know, what is, what's the discipline of how long that is, you know? Yeah, I think it's almost, I mean, it'd be nice if you had just a little haptic reminder on your watch or something that would tell you, you know, time to wrap it up. Um, I, I learned a lot of this going through media training. The first several books I did, the publisher sent me to media training. And so I went to three different kind of boot camps on that. And they really train you on that. And they will, 
they will tell you, especially on live television, you know, if you get two or three minutes total, that's a long time. That's a long segment on TV. Wow. Wow. And if you don't, if you don't realize that you're there to make the host the hero and you try to be the hero and just talk nonstop and come and don't come up for air, you don't get invited back. Yeah. Wow. And you've got to really be succinct. But I think even today in homilies, you know, I, I, I've caught myself before, you know, very enthusiastic about what I was preaching on and then looking down at the clock and realize, oh my gosh, I've gone for 20 minutes. I, I, I thought that was going to be 12 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. In my classroom teaching, I, if I realize, and we actually, this is sort of a joke in all of our ministry too. If we know so clearly when we're working with young people that unless we give them space to write and think and like take a little chunk of information, some content, and then give processing space. Yes. Totally. Then, and that processing space, if you're asking everybody to immediately, immediately verbally give feedback, you're only going to get the feedback from a couple quick thinkers. And that the writing space gives everybody time to process. And then actually, then you know that they're engaged with their content in a in a way that you want them to be engaged. Then their questions are better. Then their insights are better. So, you know, I think this is really important because um, I, I have some grandchildren with learning disabilities, and and one of the things they've measured in that is how fast they process information. And some people are just slow processors. And I used to think fast processing equals good and slow processing equals bad. No, that's totally neutral. It's just it's just a difference. And sometimes the slow processors are the more substantive ones. But like you said, if you don't make space for that, it's a problem. And I used to actually think that introverts were the ones who wouldn't talk right away and extroverts always would, but that's also not true. Sometimes like you've got some just fast talking, like introverts with a quick question and they're always gonna be the first one with an answer and they wanna engage that professor. Um, and then, you, then it's just, they're different, different methods and giving space for everybody and getting those, those slower processors yeah. to have amazing insight and feedback and to own a message and then be able to do something exciting with it. It's this so is a, a kind of a workshop format that we follow, but in our coaching sessions, usually what happens is one of our coaches will give a lecture, you know, interspersed with the audience asking questions or whatever, but then we'll immediately go from that to a exercise where they have to write and respond to what was done. And then we put them into a small group like table groups where they can discuss it with their peers for further processing. And then we come back for group wide questions Then we take a break and then we go back through that cycle again. So typically we'll do that four or five times in a day. And it's a very useful format. I've started to say in youth ministry, teaching and learning are not the same thing. Well, that's the truth. <laughs> And we usually think that when we teach, people automatically learn, and they don't. No. Teaching and learn, and you have to create space for both. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that when people just hear the teaching, the follow through is so minuscule. And the more that you engage them, the more likelihood there's gonna be application. And ultimately what I'm after is not even that, I'm looking for transformation, and that takes more processing. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Okay. So step two is engage your audience. Tell us about step three. Step three is to invite questions, which sounds pretty simple, but anytime you communicate, uh, there are going to be questions. They're going to be either spoken or unspoken, but there's going to be questions. And that's, oh, that's because there's always a gap between um, your understanding and their understanding or what you're trying to say and what they understand you say. There's always, I don't care how great of a communicator you are because everybody comes from a different perspective with a different background, with a different set of circumstances. So I think we've got to ask ourselves the question, first of all, are we open to that? Are we open to receiving questions? And if you don't want to hear questions, why not? Could it be, particularly if you're a leader, because you're not that confident about the idea? Do you believe that other people's input or feedback will make your idea better? 
Or do you think that that's your job as the leader, that you ought to be able to come up with the perfect idea and you shouldn't have to entertain questions or entertain feedback? Or do you mistakenly think that questions are some form of personal attack? And I think as leaders, we have to welcome questions. They give us, and this is the reframe, they give us the opportunity to bring greater clarity to the topic. And as a result, we should not only anticipate questions, but invite questions. And by the way, it's a good thing, particularly again when the stakes are high, to anticipate questions because, because there's going to be questions. And the more, especially again when the stakes are really high, the more we've thought through the answers that people are going to have, it gives us a chance to get in their shoes, to anticipate the questions, and even have talking points for those questions. And I'm not saying you do this for everything at all. But again, when the stakes are high, when it's a volatile situation, it's good to anticipate that so you're not just shooting from the hip. That's where I think as leaders we get into more trouble when we you know, open our mouth and are processing out loud in a high stake situation and people misunderstand. So we've got to invite questions. Yeah, as I think about it, um, there are some ministry contexts where a ministry leader needs to communicate with a flock, with a team, um, with a broader community about something that they can't answer some questions on. Um, and so questions are going to be normal, but there does have to be some prep around there's some sensitive information. There could be, you know, either family, like families' lives involved that is confidential information. God forbid there's sometimes lawsuits involved. There, there are things yeah. like that where something's going on with the parish or with a community where you can't share all the information. So how would you recommend leaders navigate those situations when they might have to say something to a whole parish or to a whole parish council or something like that? And there, there need to be questions, but they can't answer. Yeah, I think there's that falls into two groups. And by the way, we're getting some questions in here, Marion. I see your questions. We'll get to those in just a minute. Um, I, I think I don't think there's anything wrong with first of all just saying I don't know. When somebody asks a question that you generally don't know the answer to, much better to say I don't know, but I'll get back to you, rather than to try to wing it in the moment and give out wrong information or information that you'd like to retract later or somebody has to walk back. And you don't want to be in that position. So saying you don't know doesn't mean that you're not the leader or that somehow you're disqualified. Because I used to think when I was younger that leaders had to have all the answers. If you didn't have the, all the answers, there was you know a deficit in your leadership. That is absolutely not true. But then there are those situations like you bring up, Anne, where there are times when we just can't give the information because of confidentiality or sensitivity or whatever. And I think in those situations, we just have to honestly say, you know what? I honestly can't comment. And, and especially you could reframe it like this. You know, one of the things I'm committed to as your priest is confidentiality. And so when people share things with me, you know, that's something I take very, very seriously. And I just can't comment. And I hope you'll respect that. The, th the yeah. great thing about that is that actually reinforces trust in your leadership. Because people know that, oh, he does take this seriously. And if I share something with him in confidence, He's not going to breach that confidence because he's committed to confidentiality. Yep. Yeah. And then I would say probably thinking about the impact on whoever is asking the question and what their bottom line impact is, what their concerns are, and figuring out a way to address those without breaking confidentiality. Yeah. And sometimes there's something that might apply to a subgroup and you could pull them aside or whatever. You know, there's another thing that I think we should mention here, too. I think that when there's a power differential. You're the priest, yeah. particularly if you're the bishop. Um, people are afraid to ask you questions. You know, there, there's, I, I've, I've given it a name. I don't know if anybody else has, but I call it episcophobia. But where, you know, it's fear of bishops. And if I ask a question, I could get in trouble. And there's pe there people like that. I mean, I know pe people like this in my own parish, not just with the bishop, but with the priest. They just, they'll talk to other people about it, but they won't. Ask the priest, the one guy that can answer it, they won't ask, right? And so I think as that's incumbent upon us in leadership, when we, when we know that there's a power differential, we have to create a safe environment for them to ask questions. And so literally to, to say things, you know, like, look, um, 
I'm sure there are things that I've missed here, or I really need your input, or what do I need to clarify, or I really need your input here. You know, I, I know I'm the bishop, or I know I'm the priest, but I'm sure I've missed things, and I need your help. That's why God has given us to each other so that we're stronger together, and I need your help. And then just be quiet. That's awesome. Mm, that's great. Okay, so step one is get clarity before you communicate. Step two is engage your audience. Step three is invite questions. What is step four? Okay, step four is to listen actively. So when you receive feedback or questions, listen carefully. Be fully present. The temptation that you must avoid at all costs is to become defensive. Nothing will undermine your leadership or destroy what you're trying to build with the people you're trying to lead than becoming defensive. So this is while the questioner is still speaking, you're busy in your head, already composing a reply and not really listening. And what that communicates is that you've stopped listening. People can sense it. They may not be able to put words to it. They may not be able to articulate it but they can tell. And so to listen actively, what I want to suggest is that um, a few tips. First of all, focus intently on the person speaking. Lean in, make eye contact. The other thing I would say as a leader that's critically important, assume positive intent. In other words, assume or trust that they genuinely want to understand you or they genuinely want to offer an opinion to be helpful. They probably didn't get up that morning saying, how can I sabotage father's meeting today or the bishop's meeting or your meeting if you're not a, a clergy person? So I think that, you know, assuming positive intent is always really good. And I think I may have given this story beforehand, so forgive me if I have, but um, I used to have a web developer that he just had this like superpower of seeing what was missing in any proposed plan. And there used to be this, there, there became this kind of buzz in the office about him. Like he was negative. <laughs> like this person is always negative, but in his mind, and I'd worked with him for a long time. In fact, I'd worked with him longer than anybody else in the company. He was always trying to be helpful. And again, it was a superpower, but I had to go to him privately. And I had to say, Andrew, what you have to share is vitally important. And I absolutely don't want to shut that down, but it's an issue of timing. So give everybody a chance to brainstorm, give everybody a chance to talk about, you know, the positive stuff and then come alongside and, and share it. And, and even my own daughter, who's now the CEO of our company, initially she was so taken back by it. You know, she was, she kind of got negative on him. And I, and I said, you got to assume positive intent. He really is trying to help. The other thing I would say as a tip is suspend the inner dialogue in your mind long enough to hear. And, and one of the tricks I've found is in that situation to ask a follow-up question before I respond. That just gives me a chance to think a little bit more, gives me a chance to get clarity, because I may, they may come out the gate with something and I react to it, and that wasn't their issue at all. But I heard something they weren't actually saying. So if I could just pause and say, could you say more about that? Or help me um, understand what you meant by this. That gives you a chance for greater clarity. And then just respond non-defensively. And I think as leaders, we really have to affirm people that ask tough questions. Because if we don't, we won't get it. And it doesn't mean the problem goes away. It just means that now we're flying blind. We have nobody who's given us the impact or the input we need that will probably keep us from going off track. So when somebody shares something really hard, you know, somebody that shares something that's difficult for us to hear, we need to thank them. You know, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for the courage of speaking up. That's really important. And I want more of that. So thank you. That's awesome. I, I so resonate with this assuming positive intent that I can't tell you how often 
in our work, I, um, you know, somebody will coach me about somebody's negative intent, you know, and just to be aware of it, you know. Um, and I know in parishes, it just is so tempting to, you know, think about somebody, oh, they're the person who always does this. And so when they're going to bring this up at the meeting, they always do this, you know. And number one, I love your example of the guy in your work who really thought he was being helpful and how if we can always switch and just that assumption, just, just you're going to assume something. Why not assume positive intent? Absolutely. Why not assume they have the image and likeness of, <laughs> of the Lord in them, <laughs> you know, and that you're just going to love them, you, you know, and just and 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 assume that actually if you can do that, it may transform the moment. Yes. Um, so I just I love that because I, I do think it could change a lot if we were more disciplined about that. So, and sometimes people, they seem to us to be negative, and then maybe they are negative because they don't feel like they're being heard. And they just keep having to amp it up, trying to get heard. And if, yeah. if they feel like they've genuinely been heard and you get it, they can dial it down and relax. And yeah. um, do you know the name Bob Goff? I do. I have not read his stuff, but it's on the shelf to be read. <laughs> well, he's one of the most inspiring People I know, he's a Christian guy, not or, or, not Orthodox, but I published him when I was at Thomas Nelson Publishers, and he's gone on to have an amazing career. But but Bob says this. He says, always assume the least creepy explanation. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> and my wife is like such a, so good at this, you know, and she'll correct me often because I, you know, I'm I'm not assuming positive intent. Like I'm talking about it. But I kind yeah. of default to assume a negative yeah. intent, yeah. and she yeah. has to correct me. But she is so good at that, so positive, and it's it's good for me. I'm I'm hoping someday I can really learn it like I need to. Mm, that's awesome. Okay, so step four is listen actively. Tell us about step five. Step number five: weigh your words. So when you communicate, especially in response to questions or challenges. It's vital to weigh the impact of your word, words on others. And it's especially true when you're a, in a leadership position, especially if you're a priest or a bishop, because your words are invested with more weight than you can imagine. Everywhere you go, you're leaving a wake. Everything you say is having an impact. And people amp up your words. They will make them more consequential than you probably intended, more significant than you probably intended. And so you have to weigh your words and really think through not only what you're saying, but how you're saying it. So even a critical or a dismissive response to a question can be damaging to morale. And by the way, it also has a chilling effect on the others who are present. So the fastest way to shut down feedback and constructive input is to offer a curt reply or to suggest that the questioner is ignorant. And it also undermines your ability to communicate in the future. And so this calls for self-awareness and it calls for others' awareness. And that's why we have to be willing to um, create an environment that's safe for dissent where people can say what they're thinking without fear of being shut down. And so I think, again, we have to reframe it when we're getting negative feedback, to reframe it as God assisting us in becoming even more clear in what we're trying to say, or to be showing us something that we're missing. There may be just things that we've completely overlooked because, let's be honest, our experience is limited. Our perspective That's is great. limited. Um, how we were raised creates limitations. You know, our ethnicity, all of that, you know, creates its own set of lenses through which we see the world, and it's not the only way to see the world. So we need other people to speak into that, and we need to see that as a God-given thing to help us be better. That's great. Yeah, I I also, you know, I, I think about it on the other side of, you know, the person who, uh, you know, got to hang around some pretty amazing leaders at St. Vlad's when I was a student. And, um, 
and how, you know, yes, the words of the leader did create a big wake. Sometimes what I had to learn was that their words or lack thereof had nothing to do about with me at all. <laughs> You know, um, and we were, you know, it was just one of those things that happened at student as students is, you know, you'd pass a faculty member, you know, walking to chapel or something and they didn't say anything to you. Well, it wasn't because you'd done terribly on a paper or they didn't like the homily you just practiced. It was because they were thinking about something else. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and just on the other side, go e going easy on leaders who. Yes. Um, just have a lot on their plates and they're going to try the best they can to weigh their words as you've coached, you know, and to do it right. But from the other side, um, you know, just, just go easy, you know, just, you know, assume positive intent of the leaders who are, are, are holding a lot together and, um, and productively use your own words to clarify what you need from them in a way that actually assumes best intent of them too. And then I think about it from the leader's angle and I think, you know, um, I have been the recipient of um, harsh words from somebody questioning me when, you know, really I have to do all of this work to make sure that I'm not emotionally responding, that I'm not being defensive. Mm -hmm. And I've started to coach people too on how to like, listen, I want to hear you. Um, I want to hear the heart of what you're saying. You're assuming bad intents in me. And that feels so crappy, you know, and actually being able to communicate to that, that like that, that was not my intent at all. Yeah. Um, you know, and just, just being more transparent about what's going on on, on all different levels. Well, I think this is, so difficult in our culture today because you know we really value outrage and it's amplified by the media you know whether it's on twitter or all the you know different commentary shows you know that everybody's outraged it's like a whole industry and you, you have to we have to understand there's a business model behind that 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 when people get emotional they don't turn away and they keep watching what they're watching so that they can monetize your attention and serve up ads. And I think we just got to go, whoa, stop. We need to be, particularly those of us in the church, we need to be people of grace. You know, to, you know, we've received great grace and we need to extend it to other people as well and give people the benefit of the doubt, assume positive intent, be quick to forgive. And, you know, priests and bishops have bad days. They do. You know, just like you and me, we have bad days when we're not at our very best. And, you know, I think in those situations, it's so much better if we can just say, you know, I don't really think that, like, like you were saying, it wasn't about me. You know, there was something else going on in his or her life. And, you know, I just, I need to be forgiving. You know, my, my oldest daughter, uh, Megan, she often says, you know, nobody thinks about you more than you think about you. And that's the truth. You know, that person probably wasn't thinking about us when they, you know, looked away from us or seemed distracted, probably had nothing to do with us. That's good stuff, Deacon Michael. I think you could do a whole podcast on our, our cultures wanting us to value outrage and how that turns into clickbait bait. Um, there's a really interesting um, scholar, this guy, Arthur Brooks, and just in the Atlantic last week, he published an article called How Not to Freak Out. Ooh. Just so interesting that the Atlantic is publishing articles on coaching people how not to freak out. That's not typically what <laughs> major news sources do, right? No, that's or exactly right. Brilliant people who teach at Harvard use their time. They don't usually use their time helping a readership not freak out. I'm going to look that article up. Um, yeah, but it's the world we're in today. And so it's a great article, you know, has really, really good it points. It sounds good. But, um, yeah, but weighing your words, it's a great point. So thank you for that. So you have one more here, uh, point step six. I do. And it's this. 
gently, gently redirect nonstop talkers. Okay, so I have to tell you a story. Um, I was leading a workshop. This was probably 15 years ago. It was when I was the CEO of Thomas Nelson. I was leading this. We had at the time 70 vice presidents, and it was a leadership workshop that I was walking them through. And um, every time I stopped for questions, one guy, I'm going to call him Bill, wasn't his name, but Bill would be the first to raise his hand and stand up and talk. And so I appreciated how eager he was, at least initially, but then it happened every single time. And I could see his colleagues, because I was in the front of the room, people rolling their eyes and God, oh Lord. And worse, once he started talking, he didn't want to give up the mic. And so we literally had mics at the table. So he would take the mic and he would just talk and talk and talk and talk. And so finally, I thought, I, I, I've got to address this or this is going to go south. Now, what were my options? My option was I could interrupt him and try to redirect it, but that seemed rude. Uh, the other option is I could have reproved him in public or made a joke, made him the butt of the joke and embarrassed him. I didn't think that would be very productive. So what I did was at the first break, I just went over, knelt down. He was sitting in his chair at his table and just quietly said to him, I said, hey, I know you've got a lot to share and it's very valuable. But here's the thing. It's not giving anybody else a chance to share. You're probably not even aware that it's happening. And so I need you to moderate your behavior. I, I want you to keep talking, but I don't want you to be the first to stand up and you can't talk as long. So I want you to be self-aware about that. Got it? And he said, got it. Okay. And it was great. So there was like, I didn't embarrass him in front of anybody. I didn't damage the relationship. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, I want you to know how much I appreciate you saying that because honestly, I was completely unaware of it. I was just excited about the content. That's so, so great. We've got to be willing uh, to gently redirect those people. Now, there's a lot of techniques we can do this. And in smaller meetings, it's important too, but it does frustrate people and it, and it bores people. And it, you know, there could be a whole narrative that gets created about that, that person if we're not careful. So, you know, for some of those people, we may just need to say, Hey, Bill, thanks for sharing that, but I want to hear from some of the other people. You know, that's another way to redirect it if you have to do it in real time and can't, you know, pull them aside. But here's the thing I've realized. There's often quieter people in attendance that sometimes have the real gold, the real valuable content, and sometimes they have to be, you know, you, you just can't wait for them to speak up. You have to and this is the, probably the wrong term, but call them out to say something like, Jennifer, I'd be interested to know what you had to think about, what you think about this. You know, here's what not to say. Jennifer, you're awfully quiet. Now I've just embarrassed her. Right. You know, say, Jennifer, I am really curious how you're processing this. What do you, what do you think? Yeah. You know, call those people out. So it's, it's, it's very helpful. And I find that, Almost all the time, that person who is the quietest is the person that has the most thoughtful thing to say. So I, I think there's a couple things that we can do as leaders to make sure that other people feel like they have permission to share and want to share. And one of the things I've learned is to avoid speaking first as the leader. Like, and, and here's, here's what happens is you ask the question, there's a power differential, people are afraid to speak. And you're afraid of silence. So you answer your own question. Or you speak up and you think, oh, okay, well, nobody else has as good of an idea as I do. And I thought about this. I have an idea. So you start speaking. So you've got to ask the question and then shut up. Just be quiet and get comfortable with uh, what they call in the radio business, dead air. People will talk if you just shut up. And I, I learned that in therapy. My therapist would ask me something and they just wouldn't talk. It was kind of maddening because it made me uncomfortable. 
but he was just fine. He was just very patient. And it, and it gave me the space to think about it. And usually those were the most impactful parts of the therapy. But it's hard, right? Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I love, I love what you said about um, how with nonstop talkers, you actually gave that person the gift of feedback instead of just structuring it around them in a way such that you'd minimize them, but they'd never have that self-awareness. Yeah. And it's really easy. And I've, I've been guilty of this in my past too. You know, you just stop inviting that over talker to meetings. Right. And then they're just like, well, why wasn't I invited to this meeting? What's, what's happening? They're just confused. They don't get yeah. to grow in their leadership. Yeah. And that's where I think speaking the truth in love is like a superpower that God has given us, but it requires courage on our part because the easier thing is just to dismiss that person, not include that person, make fun of that person, you know, do something not constructive. But if we'll invest in those people, most people just need a little gentle nudge and they can totally be productive and really add to the conversation. Yeah, that's great. Okay, we've got some listener questions that we want to get to, but first let me summarize what we heard you say. Deacon Michael, two-way communication isn't as difficult it may, as it may seem. Even if you're the listener rather than the speaker, there are things you can do to ensure that clear communi communication happens. Here are some simple steps that will up your level of communication skill. Step one, get clarity before you communicate. Step two, engage your audience. Step three, invite questions. Step four, listen actively. Step five, weigh your words. Step six, gently redirect nonstop talkers. Okay, with that, let's take some questions. Again, if you have a question or even a comment, just post it in the comment section. Okay, so questions, here we go. Do you have right. one that you wanna start with there? No, go ahead. Are you seeing them all? Yeah, I think I, think I am. We've got quite a long chain here, but I'm looking way back up. Um, uh, Marianne says, two groups of people that I, losing conversation, leaders who typically are the speakers in a professional setting and teenagers in church ses settings. Any advice? Great question. And I'm gonna let you speak to this because you're the expert on the second part of this for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the second one and then you can, um, you can take the first. Um, yeah, teenagers in church set settings. Um, it's interesting. I was just having conversations with people around um, young adults in church settings and how to keep their attention. Um, there's so many different factors. Uh, one is, you know, um, are you are you the person who should be speaking to them about a particular topic? You know, mm. are you the are you the right person to engage them at a particular time and moment? Um, and so there's there's just that, and we could get into that. Uh, that could take a while, but. Um, but I think uh, asking questions, I would say, would be the place you'd want to start with teenagers instead of starting with content. Um, I recently was um, talking with a dear friend who sat down and asked three high school students at her church what were their big struggles right now, what was going on in their lives, and what were they interested in. And she was really surprised that everything that she, the questions that were drove her as a high school student were different for for these three um, young women she sat down and talked with. Um, they had a different set of things they were interested in. And because she asked them their questions, she then built a relationship with them. She listened to them clearly, and then she could design um, education that met their real questions needs. But more important than that even, they were gonna listen to her because they built a relationship with her. And so um, they listen to you when they feel like, uh, you know them and you care about them and you have something valuable to share with them. You've thought about it. You've planned ahead on what you're going to communicate. Um, right. And starting with questions, I think, is just the way to go. Well, I love I love that because it communicates that you value them. You know, to ask them a question really communicates value and esteem. And that's the beginning of building trust and creating uh, a productive relationship. The first part of this question, Marion, I'm not sure I understand if you want to clarify it, you can, but you said 
Um, and, and Anne, you may be able to enlighten me, but I lose in conversation leaders who typically are the speakers in a professional setting. I, I, I don't know if I'm about to answer your question or not, so you can tell me, Marion. But I, I think that a lot of times speakers in a professional setting are in speaker mode. And so you almost have to catch them in a different setting or invite them into a different setting if you want to have a conversation. Uh, I, I, I can tell you as a speaker, somebody who speaks professionally, that it's really easy to be distracted in those environments. And I'm, I'm probably not the best in two-way conversation after I've just spoken or before I'm very distracted before I just speak. I'm totally focused on what I'm about to deliver. So, you know, in that setting, I'm probably not good at two-way conversation either. So it may just need to change the yeah. context. Yeah. Yeah. The, her very, Marianne, your very next question is, should there be a max number of points to make when giving a lesson to youth teens? Oof. So much depends on context, to how long you have them for, what your relationship is. I mean, are we talking about a 20-minute Sunday school class? Are we talking about a, you know, Good Friday, Holy Friday retreat all day? Um, so I think I would titrate my answer based on that. But in general, um, one to three, <laughs> um, unless you're storytelling. And if you're storytelling, and, and really our scripture is story, um, mm. And stories aren't aren't boiled down into simple points most of the time. And so, if you're if you're going through the story, the stories of our gospels, if you're going through you know Paul's letters or um, stories of the Old Testament, um, I usually like to let the story sit with with folks, let them read the text very carefully, and then figure out what they're learning from it, and let them come away with their own points, That's honoring their agency. Yeah. That's good. You know, there's a really good book on this topic uh, by a friend of mine, Ken Davis. It's called The Dynamic the Secrets of Dynamic Communication. And he does a conference called the SCORE Conference, and that's SCORE. It's an acronym. It has two R's in it, the SCORE Conference. And it's really good. It's I, I've never been to anything that's had a bigger influence on my writing and speaking than that conference. In fact, I was so excited about it when I went through it the first time that I became a co-author or co-owner in the business for about five years. And then I realized it didn't really fit in with my own business. So I sold my part of it back to him, but, but it's so valuable, but the book will be really helpful to you. Oh, that's awesome. Great suggestion. Okay. So now I'm scrolling down to more questions. Let's see what we got here. Uh, in group meetings is where I sometimes find it difficult to articulate my points quickly enough and succinctly. Aha. Yep. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, in that kind of situation, if you're not the leader, you may just say, hey, would it be okay with you if I thought about this and came back to you? Because I think I, I do have some thoughts, but I, I'd like to give it a little bit more thought before I express it. Yeah, that's great. Some people that just need more, sense. again, more processing time and there's, Nothing wrong with that. Doesn't mean you're stupid or slow. It just means that's just how God wired you, and that's okay. Yeah. I'm scrolling through. Uh, folks, if you have a question that we missed, oh, um, oh, here was something uh, Randa shared. She said, sometimes I might talk too much when I feel anxious, and so talking more relieves that because it gives a sense of control over the situation. That's, that's a great really example. Good. Yeah, I'm guilty. You know, I've, I've done that for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So insightful. That's great. I don't see any more questions, Deacon Michael. Let me just double check and make sure that we haven't had anything come in on our anonymous line. No, we have not. Okay. All right. I think we can. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us. We're so glad to have you here. We'll be back again next week here. At the same time, we plan to discuss the challenge of difficult conversations. Deacon Michael will share four principles for practicing what he calls the kindness of candor. Can't wait, Deacon Michael. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts for today? Yeah, I, th I would say remember that two-way conversation is, again, like we started, a ping pong game. So ask yourself in your conversations this week, am I giving other people adequate opportunity to express themselves in other words, don't dominate the conversation. And then see if you can graciously, if you've got somebody that's just 
an over talker, see if you can graciously redirect that in a way that's productive and honors the other person, but changes the behavior. That's your leadership challenge for the week. Love it. Thank you so much. Christ is risen. Truly is risen. Thanks, Anne. 